and good evening everybody um i'm gonna dive straight into the slides um because we've got quite a few of them and um, but in order to understand why we're working um you know are looking at hydrogen as one of the, the potential solutions in our transition to a zero emissions fleet i want to start by kind of setting the background of the fleet operation that we have in bus air and um and the emissions journey we've kind of taken to date uh, and then hopefully that'll help kind of set the scene for the next decade and beyond of, of the challenge that's ahead for us. So uh, just in terms of our fleet um, operations, uh, we operate the bulk of nationwide bus and coach services outside of Dublin City. Um, services which are predominantly operated by our sister company, Dublin Bus. Uh, we operate the city bus services in the main four regional cities uh, and a, a range of commuter regional intercity and school transport services across the country as well uh, including the greater dublin area actually and, and from a total of 17 depots um, so we have an operating revenue of 366 million with 2800 employees roughly um, and as i said we we operate uh, currently operates 1070 coaches and buses across the country um, every day and we're part of the cie group i think that barry mentioned there with our sister companies dublin bus and irish rail um, in terms of the, the fleet, as I said, it's, it's Ireland's largest coach uh, and bus fleet. And I'm just going to kind of get into a little bit. It's important to kind of understand the operational differences between a bus and a coach um, product, if you like. Um, so just to explain the product lines that we have, we, we operate um, the bulk of, of services um, outside of Dublin, said, under the Transport for Ireland brand for the NTA. Um, and we operated with 340 coaches, uh, and they're the type of vehicles that you're looking at on the um, three pictures there. Um, we also operate 280 buses, which are more the typical type of buses you'd see um, operate with the city services. Um, so, you know, both, both coaches and buses, we have single decks, double decks, long ones, short ones, uh, and all the rest of it. But they're the kind of numbers we're operating under the Transport for Ireland services. Uh, we operate our own commercial. Um, section as well called Expressway, which you'll probably see out in the road. Uh, we have 125 coaches in, in that. And again, very similar to the coaches on the left there under the Transport for Ireland brand. Um, beyond that, we have another 310 coaches in the school transport fleet and a small number of um, bus-based products as well in that. Um, they're those coaches predominantly older coaches. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of concentrate on the transport in Ireland and the expressway side of the, the, the numbers there, so 465 coaches and 280 buses. I suppose the important thing for us is, you know, if you look at Bus Air, and we're, we're a predominantly coach company with buses that we operate. Um, okay. Um, Barry, you can still hear me there, can you? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, you're still there. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure. I, did. I, was, I thought it was. No, keep working away. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to concentrate on those two. It's it's primarily co coach fleet. If you compare it to Dublin bus, you know they've they've a thousand um, buses out on the streets of Dublin, and they're they're all buses like those two at the bottom left hand corner there. Okay. Um, when we talk about the operation then of those kind of buses and coaches, when we look at city buses and and what we use in the city services in in Limerick, Cork, uh, Galway, Waterford, and some of the regional towns. That those kind of single and double deck buses and um, typically 10 to 12 meters in length they, they operate this kind of urban short distance stop start you know short distances between bus stops so therefore they operate with low average speeds around 15 to 22 kilometers an hour and um, they operate at maximum speed legally of 65 kph um, and typically the engine sizes in a diesel uh, engines are, are kind of mostly five liter engines now around 240 horsepower um, annual kilometres on those city buses, kind of 50 to 60,000. Um, so the daily range in there is kind of anything up to 52 to 300. It's, it's typically about 200 kilometres um, a day per bus. Okay. On commuter services in the Greater Dublin area, for example, uh, we also use a very, very similar kind of product in terms of the, the city bus product. Uh, it, it does that kind of route. You're talking about outer urban services there, which are short to medium distance, um, multi-stop, kind of low to medium average speed, so slightly higher average speeds than, than, than an urban, a pure urban environment. Um, but again, the same kind of maximum speed is 65 kph. Um, 
and the diesel end, same same engine at the back end. Annual the kilometers a little bit higher around eighty thousand, and you know your daily range is in around the two hundred to five hundred um, kilometer range. Again, you're probably talking about you know in in around three three fifty um, four hundred kilometers a day. Okay. Um, when you move into the coach sector, there the coach segment that we have, we also operate those vehicles in in commuter and regional um, services. Uh, again, you're, those vehicles slightly bigger, slightly bigger beasts. They're twelve to fourteen meters long. Um, you're talking about vehicles going out. Um, you know, in comparison to the bus one above that, you know, that'd be out to Ashburn, that kind of distance. On, on these coaches, you're talking about Navan, uh, Cavan, even that that kind of distance, Wicklow. And so on. So they're they're kind of slightly medium, what we call medium distance and, and multi-stop and kind of more medium to high speed. So again, you can see the increase in the average speed there again. Um, and these times these these vehicles are certified to operate up to 100 kilometers an hour um, on, on the um, motorways and stuff like that. So again, the, the, the engines at the back of these things tend to be a lot bigger. You know, you're talking about nine, nine to 13 liters on those big double deck coaches there, you know, anything up to 480 horsepower annual kilometers up to 100,000. Um, and then the daily range on those is kind of you're up into near the 800s. Okay? Very similar vehicles used on our expressway uh, intercity service. Um, again, 12 to 14 meters. Um, again, you're on higher average speeds because you're you're now into this long longer distance kind of motorway. Um, Dublin, you know, Cork, Dublin up to Donegal, um, Cork, Waterford, um, across the Tralee and that type of thing. Um, so, you know, again, more limited stops, so there's higher higher operating speed. So, uh, again, you're up to about 40, 60 kilometers an hour and about 200. Some of these coaches can do 250,000 a year. Um, so the daily range on some of those can can top a thousand and more as well. OK, so that's just to give an idea of the, the type of, you know, how the, the segments in the operation um, are set out. Um, you can see. You know, when we're talking about fuel cell vehicles and, you know, we know battery electric are, are there and, and battery electric will lend themselves very well to a lot of the urban city bus type of operation. And um, that's why it kind of makes sense when we're looking at fuel cells. You can't get fuel cell vehicles in coaches at the moment. The products aren't there yet. We'll come to that later. So that's why it, it makes sense for us when we're looking at hydrogen and fuel cells to look at that kind of commuter bus because we can get a product there. Uh, and that's that's where we've pitched the three buses on those kind of routes at the, um, up to now at the moment. So I'll, I'll come back to them later anyway, but just to set the backdrop. So to turn to our kind of the emissions reduction journey that we've taken so far, um, we've spent the guts of 30 years running through the six different phases of the Euro emission standards um, from 1992 right through to now. And the you know you can see the little green box there, that represents where Euro 6 um, Kind of ends up in comparison to what where, where it started so it's significant reduction in um, most of the kind of carcinogenic nasty um, tailpipe emissions um, that were in the in, in the in the mix and um, I suppose you know it's, it's taken 30 years to do that and to get it there and um, but Euro 6 is actually classified as a low emissions technology and it's, it's kind of understated in that respect I think in fairness to it um, but the Euro emission standards targeted those as said tailpipe emissions, the, the carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons and oxygen, particular matter in particular, um, but not greenhouse gas emissions as a CO2. And, and that was really because the challenge for diesel engine designers and manufacturers and all that stuff, it was, it was a big enough challenge to try and get those um, tailpipe emissions down. Um, CO2 was kind of, that's another challenge and we'll, we'll address that at a, at a later point. So. The thing with CO2 is it's, it is directly related to diesel consumption. Um, and, you know, when we look across the, the euro levels in that 30 years, there's very negligible reduction in diesel consumption and therefore CO2 in that. It's marginal, small, a couple of percent, that type of thing. It, it varied between those. So that's kind of where we've come from um, in, in the emission standards to date to, 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 to clean things up. Um, where we kind of want to get to, if, if you look at that, I know this is this is based on kind of car technology graph, but it's, it's the principles are pretty much the same uh, overall. So if you look at the top right hand corner there, you know, diesel and petrol, that's where they are out there in terms of energy consumption, wealth of fuel and, and greenhouse gas emissions. Hybrids, um, you know, you can see an improvement with hybrids. It's still still a fossil based technology. 
Um, when you come down into fuel cells uh, at the top of the green band and the blue band there, you know, this is fuel cells and battery electric where they're, they're powered by fossil based fuels. Um, where we want to get to is down in that orange band there where you can see battery electric vehicles powered by um, renewable electricity and fuel cells powered by renewable hydrogen uh, coming off the renewable electricity. And then, you know, the interesting one for me there is the plug-in hybrid with fuel cell, which is nearly a combination of both um, uh, technologies. But we're trying to, you know, the, the, the challenge is to get that transition from the top right-hand corner down into that orange band at the bottom. And I suppose the other interesting point on this chart is on the right hand side there where you see the costs for uh, transformation the further you come down that chart the more expensive it, it gets in terms of capex and costs and everything else so it's it's a massive massive investment that's um kind of going to be needed over the next 10 15 20 years okay. um to kind of set the picture on the scale of transition in europe because you know, the, when you see all these new technologies being rolled out, it's very visible and it's it's brilliant and it's great and 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 there's this progress being made, which is great. But I think in terms of heavy vehicle, um, you know, heavy commercial vehicles, medium and 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 heavy commercial vehicles and buses and coaches, um, you know, to put it in context of what the challenge is, um, there is currently in 2027 million medium and heavy commercial vehicles uh, in the European Union and the UK when we look at the latest stats from ACEA. 97% um, of those are still operating on diesel. Okay. Um, and there's less than 1% that actually operate on an electric based drivetrain. So whether it's battery electric or a hybrid or a fuel cell. Um, anything anything like that it's less than one percent so for seven million vehicles to transition you can imagine that's a huge and it's a huge ask and uh, I suppose one part of it is, is a huge bulk of those vehicles are kind of more than 10 years old as well so it's, it's a huge huge challenge and that's that's the scale of the transition um, when you talk about buses and coaches above the seven million there's another eight, 800 thousand buses and coaches in the EU and in, in the UK uh, vehicle park roughly, um, and about 94% of those are currently operating on diesel as well. Um, leading the way, I'll put it that way, in comparison to medium and heavy truck um, vehicles, is about 2.3% that are operated on an electric-based drivetrain. So I'm just putting those figures up there to kind of demonstrate um, how big a challenge this is, this transition program for, for um, this whole transport sector uh, and, and the scale of it. Um, but there's good news, and the good news is on the truck side, you can see uh, electric products now beginning to come or to emerge from the major um, traditional uh, diesel suppliers like Volvo, Scania, Mercedes. You can see fuel cell um, trucks as well beginning to emerge. Um, and you can see that, that picture there kind of shows the way they're trying to package the, the, the vehicle. So you can see the tanks just behind the the, the cab on, in black there you can see the fuel cells in blue and the batteries in silver where the traditional diesel tanks would have gone so um you know those products are starting to see and and you know it's it's they're not they're not uh, concepts anymore they've built them you know prototypes and stuff like that you see mercedes or tick there and the hyundai um, truck as well so that's kind of just setting out you know it's it's not all bad news it's it's good and it's on the way but it's very early early stages and early days in in that transition in, in in the Irish market, um, I suppose to talk about the numbers is about just over fifty nine thousand vehicles, uh, heavy, uh, medium heavy, and, and bus and coach, in the Irish market, and currently around ninety nine point eight percent of those are running on diesel. Um, the split between that is is about eighty twenty, um, eighty percent trucks and twenty percent buses and coaches, and then the other kind of key point here that I'll come to later is, in that vehicle park, um, there's about thirty percent of those vehicles. Or Euro six at low emissions standard um, from at this point, and, and about seventy percent are pre Euro six levels, so at Euro one to Euro five. And again, you know, I suppose the point on it, it's it's not a great starting point to try and, and deal with seventy percent of the, the the commercial fleet. Um, so th that's kind of just setting out the the scale of the transition and the challenge. Um, in, in the big picture. Um, this one here is just showing um, how alternative drive lines have kind of progressed over the last decade. 
uh, in terms of, of bus, bus and coach kind of products, particularly bus mainly here. Uh, so you can see, you know, the CNG, the blue and the green um, lines or curves there for hybrid and CNG technology. And they've been the two main technologies over the last decade that have emerged um, and, and probably originally driven for the 2012 London Olympics, that kind of thing for the hybrids in particular. CNG has been a technology that's been around for a long time. Um, and, you know, the, the increase that you'll see there is probably the, the addition of vehicles over that time period. But what you'll also see then is the, the increase in electric bus, um, battery electric buses there, which kind of kicks off slowly from 2014 on, uh, and then 2018 takes a good kick um, up upwards, uh, and flattening out in 2020 is probably the impacts of COVID, uh, where people pull back and slow down a little bit in terms of what was going on. But I think, you know, it's it's that transition. I, I remember standing on the first electric vehicle in, in uh, a trade show in Cartrick in 2013. Um, no electric vehicles on the stand of that show, but they had one uh, BDL uh, in, in Eindhoven had one out the back because it had a range of 50 kilometers. They didn't, it was a prototype. They didn't read, they weren't happy to put it on the stand at that point. Subsequent years, you could see that volume increasing in, in, in you know, what they were displaying. So it's, it's progressing and, and uh, it'll pick up again, no doubt from here on anyway, with COVID on the battery electric side. And so it's, it's a lot more established. You can see the figure for fuel cells at the bottom there. Um, it's, it's very small. It's nearly, it, you can see where there's a slight uplift. It's nearly back at the point of where fuel cells were back, or sorry, electrics were back in um, 2013. Um, but again, you'll see an uplift in that over the next, over the coming years. And there's, there's kind of reasons for that, I suppose we'll get into. Um, so just if I talk about our bus fleet, coming back to buses and coaches. So if we talk about our urban bus fleet, um, those buses that operate in the city, the kind of the left hand side of that is our is, is the transition that we've had over the 30 years um, through the euro um, emissions levels to a point of where we're at roughly on that yellow arrow at the moment now. So, you know, we've we're starting from a good base um, in comparison to the National Vehicle Park, where we're starting from um, a 70 percent euro six um, volume of, in, in our fleet as against 30 percent um, euro four and euro five. So we're starting from a good point. Uh, it's easier. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's it'll be easier for us um, in, in the long run because we have that baseline. So from, you know, in terms of diesel, we're starting to see now where we'd be pulling out that 30 percent as we start to get into this zero emission uplift. Um, we've pulled in with the NTA, we've pulled in these plug in um, diesel hybrids, which again are an electric drivetrain with a, a diesel engine as a generator in the back, as opposed to your more traditional um, series or parallel uh, hybrid vehicles that we've seen in the past. Um, but they're, they're in there to fill that gap between and, and that position between diesel, traditional diesel vehicles and zero emissions. So somewhere around, um, you know, the, the middle of this decade, middle to late this decade, we're going to have a position where we will have pulled out that 30 percent. We're starting to run down the Euro 6 diesels. We've we've got the hybrids in there and we've got that mixed with the start of electri um, electrification and zero emissions vehicles. Uh, and so we'll be starting with battery electric, but fuel cell will look more than likely play a part in there as well, in, in one form or another, particularly on routes where range is an issue that, that battery electric can't meet. And very difficult to predict, you know, what that mix will be. But, um, you, you, you know, you, you would probably see battery electric prevailing predominantly, but with um, the, the possibility of fuel cell uh, filling, filling the gap. Uh, on the rest of it so you know again you know by the end of the, the by the, the early 2030 say the you know you, you'd be aiming to be pulling the last of the diesel buses out of the fleet and then from that point on then you're kind of pulling the last of the the, the hybrids out and then you're into full zero emissions transition from there on so you know the zero emissions is going to be based around predominantly around bv in the bus fleet and um, with fuel cells probably and um, more, more than likely and there's dependencies on that but more than likely have a place to play. You, you can see where in the future as well, you could nearly see the merging of those two technologies. And, and there's snippets of it out there already that that particular bus down the bottom right hand side is from Hungary. It's a fuel cell plug, plug in hybrid electric bus. So you can plug it in, you can charge the batteries and then you put the bus out on the road. And as soon as the batteries have run down, the fuel cell kicks in and starts to charge. So it's, it's a combination of both technologies really. 
um, to look at um, battery electric and fuel cells. And uh, I'm commonly asked, um, what do you think the future is? Is it battery electric or is it fuel cells? And my answer is always to that one is, um, it's not one or the other, it's both until we see what happens, but we, we're taking that it's going to be both. And there's no real point in discounting either um, at this point. So they're both zero emissions and they're both the most likely um, zero emissions technologies to emerge. So just to take a little look at kind of what the future would look like in our context and, and what needs to happen. You know, we want to get to a point of where the grid and you know electric, electricity production, the source of that is 100% renewable. It's probably about 50, 60% or something like that of the way there, but there's more to be done. So we've got, um, you know, if you take in the future, wind, solar, hydro, waste, even whatever, and there may be others, but for this country, they're probably the main drivers at the moment. If we can get to 100% um, renewable uh, grid electricity off that on the electric side, um, this thing on. Uh -huh. yeah. um, <clears throat> and, you know, getting get the grid to 100% renewable electricity, we need to put in um, charging infrastructure. So there's, there's a, a lot of investment needed there to get the, the infrastructure on the ground to charge the buses. Um, once we get the buses, this is just a, an example of the, the way that um, an electric, battery electric vehicle will be packaged. So you can see you know, in between the, 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 the wheelbase, between front and rear axles, you can see a lot of the large flat um, battery packs, which are packaged underneath the floor. You can see them um, packaged over the front wheel arch on the left hand side. You can package them under those tanks on the right hand side as well. Um, and at the back end of the bus where the, the diesel engine traditionally would have been, again, more battery packs packed in there. Um, the, the drive line from the batteries out to the, the wheels again is motors and inverses and all the rest of it. So the, the, it's, it's, it's pure electric, but with a lot of batteries. And you're talking at the moment about products with, you know, kind of large up to 470 kilowatt um, hour packages on them, uh, capacity on them. You won't get all of that out because you have to consider the depletion of the battery capacity and, and the reserve that you'll need to hold. You know, you can't run the batteries down to zero. So you won't get 470, but you will get an amount of that. And then, you know, if you base it on overnight charging, it could be three to six hours, but there's a lot of dependencies there on whether, you know, the charging strategy you use, load management, um, routing the range, and even seasonal weather conditions, you know, winter to summer, um, you, can, you can see kind of big variations on, on range as well and uh, consumption. So I suppose in simple terms, <laughs> the batteries, the, the, the way the vehicles operate, the battery electric vehicles, you charge them up overnight, you plug them in, charge them up, plug them out in the morning, and as soon as the bus leaves the depot, your, your battery capacity is depleting until it gets down to a point where you have to put them back um, on the charger. Some of the range, um, I suppose, limitations on them can be, um, there's other options there, you can, you can put in opportunity charging, fast charging, pantograph roof bars. There's, a, there's all kinds of solutions there um, where you can give the vehicle a burst of, of charge um, while it's operating out on a, on a route, um, you know, at a bus stop or at a terminus, and that can extend the range um, a bit as well. And help, help to, to, so that's one solution, but it's an expensive solution as well. Um, on the other side, on the, on the fuel cell electric vehicle, and, and I'm going to emphasize it's an electric vehicle as well, um, you know, from... Um, you get this kind of couple of options. You can start with an electrolyzer um, at source. So at your wind farm, you, you build an electrolyzer, produce the hydrogen, and you can roll transport it into um, your hydrogen refueling station. Uh, the other option is to, you know, with your, your renewable electricity generator on the wind farm, you send that down the lines and you, you have an electrolyzer at the fueling station. Um, producing hydrogen and, and, and feeding into the fueling station. Again, huge, huge infrastructural projects um, that have to be built and have to be put in place uh, to support the, the technology and build it up. Um, if you look at the way a hydrogen bus is packaged, uh, again, as an example, um, starting at the back end there, you can see the, the, the long cylindrical tanks, gas tanks that are stacked at the back end. Um, below them, uh, there's a fuel cell box there, the fuel cell is in. Forward of the rear, or start forward of the rear axle, um, on the far side there, you have the battery pack. So much, much smaller battery pack than your your electric vehicle, um, and various different cooling systems and so on. That you know, from the batteries to the rear wheels, again to the drive axle is pretty much very, very similar. 
technology. So battery capacities on the, the three buses we have, first generation buses, they're 27.4 kilowatt hour batteries. Uh, second generation probably moving to 48. Um, so much, much smaller than your 470 on the battery electric side. You have, H, you have hydrogen onboard storage tanks, and then you have the fuel cell that charges the batteries then by by the the electrolysis process in the in the um, in the fuel cell. Um, so, in other words, I suppose in, in basic terms, the difference here is the batteries are charging while the vehicle is in motion um, until you need a H, you need to refuel on the H two side. Okay, so it's the kind of difference. It's depleting batteries on the left hand side, on the right hand side, it's Bleeding batteries and charging the bleeding batteries as the bus is moving. Okay. Um, both technologies, as I said, use similar electric drivetrain technology between the batteries and the road wheels, and they also use um, regenerative braking to try and assist the, the you know, help in, in reducing the consumption of both technologies, basically. So if we move on, just you know, and kind of summarize it, um, the range on battery electric vehicles at the moment. I said it's it's a wide window on both. Um, it can be anything from 100 to 300 kilometers. 300 kilometers is is at the far end of it. Um, you know, and, and we won't really see exactly what it will be uh, until we get buses on the road. But I'd say we'll be doing well getting 200 and 250 on them. But we'll see variances. It, it, it's 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 a difficult one to call. Um, but they are definitely capable of delivering um, a large volume of the current services, urban services, town services, city services that we have uh, right now. So hence why we're kind of going to be deploying them um, from 2022 on, starting that loan as a town service, but in the main cities from 2023 on. Okay. Um, on. On the fuel cell side, 200 to 500 kilometers fuel cells has the potential to complete the transition of anything that the, the batteries can't. So it has a, a potential role there. Um, it certainly has a potential role for outer urban commuter routes um, beyond the, the capability, but it really is dependent on the building of infrastructure to produce and deliver and supply hydrogen fuel um, between now and kind of 2025. So there's a, there's a lot of work to be done on that side and a lot of work going on on that side as well in the power um, industry. So. That was the kind of bus fleet. If you look at coach fleet side, um, the transition is slightly going to be slightly different, we guess. Um, where we are where we're positioned right now, again, we've gone through the Euro emissions levels. We have the same kind of roughly split 70-30 between Euro 6, so starting from a good base. Um, the transition probably start a little bit later, um, and it'll probably take a little bit longer. Um, and I think it's fair to say on the on the longer distance coaches and those type of products. We're going to need to rely on using a certain amount of biofuels and HVO and, and, and hybrid vehicles uh, in that mix um, for a period of time while the, the zero emissions um, side is, is ramping up and becomes more accessible and products become available in the market. So that's still a couple of years away. But the long term view on that, I suppose, is when you think about it and you think about the range capabilities of fuel cells, you could see that being perhaps the more predominant uh, technology on longer distance um, uh, operations, but there could be a place for battery electric as well in all of that. And ultimately, in the very, very long term, you could see the merging of both technologies similarly. Okay. Um, so you know, that's, that's just to show that slight difference there in 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 what we perceive might be the um, transitionary period. So uh, in terms of coaches, then um, you know we do know some of the vehicle manufacturers are currently you know, putting a lot of R and D into developing prototypes, which they're expecting to hit the road around 2024. Um, the arrangement on them is kind of like this, where the fuel tanks will be on the, the, the roof, and fuel cells down the back end, batteries packed underneath the, the luggage bay, if you like, underneath and there towards the front. Um, but the, the principal operation and, and is, is very similar in terms of the way the fuel cell operates and uh, interacts with the batteries. Um, and again, you know, we're seeing, you know, there's a, another example on the right with the, the tanks uh, mounted laterally at the rear end. Uh, so there'll be different solutions uh, or different arrangements, the way the buses are packaged, um, or the coaches are packaged. Uh, and, you know, you've, you've, you've things like Flixbus who are committing to um, some of those trials on, on fuel cell coaches in Europe as well in a couple of years' time. So that's starting to move and it's starting to progress. 
And um, as I said, prototypes from 2024, we'd expect to see early deployments of coach products in 2025, 2030, and, and mass production heading beyond 30, 2030. Um, and, and again, as I said, more likely to achieve range requirements and refuel and turnaround times than battery electric. But we are still seeing battery electric vehicles being produced um, at the early stages in, in uh, coach products, albeit with small range, you know, much lower range, but nevertheless, as I said, there may be a place for them as well. Okay. Uh, so on, on to what we've actually done ourselves in terms of dipping our toe uh, in, in the whole area to see physically, you know, um, how these vehicles kind of operate and, and work. Uh, going back, Barry mentioned um, Hydro Mobility Ireland earlier on, which is a, a group that was set up back in 2019 to look at um, a roadmap for hydrogen. Um, it was cross industry with, um, uh, you know, everybody from academics to um, power sector to um, you know operators like ourselves and some of the vehicle manufacturers uh, a lot of work done on it um, there's, there's various different things they've, they've published out there but um, it, it culminated anyway in um, the opportunity to run a trial with this little Catano bus here it's a 10.7 meters city bus we call it a midi bus but it is city bus um, and you can see the stakeholders there um, the list of you know what we were interested in um, individually is kind of listed there as well. So for the Department of Transport, an opportunity to actually use the bus and, and use and test hydrogen uh, fuel cell technology on the same kind of emissions test runs they had done in 2019 on a, a variety of different uh, technologies. Uh, for DCU, it was the academic thing, a lot of data loggers put on the buses, a lot of data captured. Um, for ourselves, CIE it was a, an opportunity to look at um, a fuel cell vehicle, what's involved in operating it, um, how they work, all that kind of thing. BOC on the fueling side, if they were interested. So it very much was, it was a six week trial. Uh, it was just to look at and um, get a feel for hydrogen vehicles and what was involved. So it, it got a quite a bit of exposure at the time. Um, you know, again, they're, they're the kind of technical sides of the powertrain, um, 180 kilowatt motors, um, regenerative braking, electronic acceleration control because the torque is, is, is very instantaneous on any electric vehicle, um, 20 kilo, kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, 20, sorry, 29 kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, and then you had kind of 37 kilo tanks, um, standard charge and um, pressure is 350 bars, um, and it was a Toyota uh, fuel cell uh, stack in that, okay. Fuel and we've, we've currently, you, you can't get a hydrogen other than a BOC out in Bluebell, produce hydrogen at a small um, industrial electrolyzer that they, they use. Uh, it's using grid electricity and water, so it's, it's quite clean uh, hydrogen. Um, but it, because it's a temporary uh, fueling point that they've set up there, you know, down the tube trailer decant, we can only get to 228 bar currently. So we're not able to get the full volume or the full uh, capacity of the tanks in there, but we certainly can get enough to, to run the buses and, and, and get a feel for them initially. But we'll move on from that uh, in the future anyway. Uh, graphic on the bottom just shows the kind of... Um, the way the, the 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 different elements interact, the hydrogen going into the fuel cell and combining the air and the oxygen into the charge the batteries, and then water out the tailpipe, uh, effectively in simple terms. Um, and the fueling on the nozzle and receptacle, you know, this kind of seems to be coming fairly standard kit. It's it's a little bit Formula One, but um, it's it's quite like diesel fueling in terms of you make the connection um, from the the, the uh, nozzle and the the receptacle and um, the, the blue bus there, that's the system on the Catano bus. Um, you see the clip there is an earth strap. Uh, and then on the top left is, I'm just about to go on to one of the, the current three buses uh, to refuel over at BOC. Um, again, storage tanks, they're, they're stand, fairly standard H2 um, storage tanks. They're, they're, they're fairly robust, very, very strong um, tanks. and huge amount of protection on these in terms of safety and, and special release devices and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's hugely important in that. And there's, there's a lot, you know, the vehicle manufacturers have a lot of that kind of end of it covered off. So, um, you know, if, if there's any issues in, in the fuel lines, you know, the, the tanks shut off, closed down, they're, they're, they're isolated. Um, and any kind of residual fuel that's in the pipes is actually very small, so it blows off fairly quickly and, and um, without any issues. Um, on the deployment on that particular one, we, we ran um, 
the Route 109A are a part of it from Dublin Airport out to Ashburn and back. Um, so around, I think around 50 kilometres, 51 kilometres. We use topography of the route. Uh, we use the diesel bus performance benchmarks on speed and um, diesel operation on it. Um, and we operated that over weeks. Um, the total trial, we, we ran other, Dublin Bus ran some of these routes for Dublin Airport around the red, green and blue car parks and around the DCU campus um, points on, on a circuit there. Uh, the, the problem we had, we, we had COVID, so numbers are very low, but we plowed ahead, we wanted to find out and we kept going with it, so um, we, we had some feedback. Fuel cells themselves, the one on the left there is a Toyota fuel cell. That was in it's in the same unit that was in the bus. It's actually the same unit that's used in the Toyota Mirai car. On the right there is the Ballard fuel cell in the in the aluminium box that um, is in the back of the three buses we currently have running. Um, been very reliable so far. We haven't had any uh, failures on the fuel cell um, part of the technology on those buses. Trial outcomes on that short trial were um, around the H2 fuel consumption. Our expectations were around seven to nine. What we saw was five to six, but we have to say it was, you know, under uh, light loads at the time due to COVID. Uh, the bus itself over the, the period it was with us to just over 3,000 kilometres. Um, so it was a reasonably good um, view uh, and first uh, hand experience with, with fuel cell. Uh, technology we got we got a feedback from the drivers very positive uh, and likewise from the passengers again you know and, and their awareness of zero emissions was was um was refreshing as well that you know they were, they were quite aware of what, what was going on so the <clears throat> while that try was going on we were also in the process um in conjunction with the nta who have been very supportive on this as well um with us working closely with them on producing three um getting Three, bus, three hydrogen fuel cell buses produced up in Wrights in Ballymena in the north and uh, they were put into service on July the 19th last year. Um, again just a little bit of a closer look there kind of ran through some of that but you, you can see again it's a little bit closer look the way that the tanks are stacked and the, the battery there um, with smaller battery pack and packaging any of these vehicles is trying to replicate the traditional um, layout, internal layout of um, the buses for passengers. So, you know, it's not it's not an alien vehicle they're getting on. There's, there's a lot of commonality and it's about how to package those and, and weight distribution and things like that and keeping keep the weight down. Um, the fuel cell as well, you know, there's just, I like this little graphic. It just demonstrates nicely how the whole system operates in terms of the hydrogen coming in the left-hand side there. Uh, it gets split to the, to the proton exchange member and at the it's split into catalysts into the um, protons and electrons. The electrons go off to the top there, charge the battery. So that little light, effectively think of that as a battery. And on the far side, then they, they, they jump back together again with the oxygen coming in to produce your, your air and, and water vapor at the tailpipe. Um, so it, it's a very clean little system. And as long as the hydrogen going in on the left hand side there is renewable, 100% uh, renewable electricity, then um, it's, it's all emission free. Which is good. Very simple technology. It's, it's unlike a diesel engine, no moving parts. Uh, so from maintenance perspective, you know you don't expect a lot to to, to go wrong. Um, you may expect like batteries after five six years in overhaul or replacement or whatever. Um, but it you know generally speaking on the the, the day to day maintenance costs on the system sh should be expected to be lower. Okay. Um, pilot deployment on those three buses. We put them on the routes from Ferry House down into Dublin City and out. Uh, one of them goes out to UCD and um, some of the Terminator Marion Row. Uh, we started off um, prudently um, and cautiously in the first six months up to the end of December with the three buses operating on Monday to Friday, um, initially light um, duties, you could say, on an AM uh, morning and, a, and an evening peak operation with fueling in between a BOC and, and various different reasons for that logistically um, so that but we wanted to start off like you don't want to put a new technology like that straight in and hammer it because you'll end up in all sorts of um, potentially trouble so the second phase of that and this year we want to look at is extending the operating schedules you know pushing the technology a little bit more um, you know we, we've a period at the moment where we're just reviewing the performance outcomes from that first phase uh, up to the end of the last year and we are also are looking at options on, you know, how we can get to 350 bar refueling, for example, to, to get us that full um, range capability on the full tanks. 
um, and, and just generally kind of use the bus now that we've got a feel for use the bus for, for tests in different environments, you know, shorter runs and longer, longer distance stuff and things like that. So they're very much three vehicles that are going to be used actively to kind of get a good, good handle on this. At the end of the day, for public transport in particular, it really is about abating CO2 emissions and, and moving to zero emissions. Because you know we need to make the public transport system the cleanest mode of transport um, for moving as many people as possible as quickly as possible at the same time. Um, and you know, in that context, just to give an idea, if you take the three buses and the mileage that it did in the first six months last year, broadly speaking, to try and put on the cloud of CO two that those buses have saved from going into the into the environment um, is is about the size of 25 buses wide six buses deep um, parked on a on a pitch it looks like that it would, it would cover that area so you know that's just six months three buses um the potential we see on it whether it's battery electric or whether they're fuel cells um you know we project you're going to be abating about 60 to 75 tons of co2 per bus on average every year or about 80 000 tons annually across the fleet Okay, so the big numbers, but then think about those numbers earlier on in the European context of 7.8 million vehicles and the impact of that uh, at the end of that transition period. So um, just to give an example on the diesel to hydrogen comparison, um, if you can take, if you take a, any, any vehicle doing about 33 litres per 100 kilometres, you know, some trucks will do less, buses will do less, some you know, coaches, some, some will do more, but just if you take a, and, and, and uh, that kind of figure as a consumption figure on diesel and you take it uh, a similar kind of fuel cell vehicle with that kind of consumption which is consistent with what we're seeing on, on fuel cell at the moment um that equivalent that six to seven kilos is really equivalent to about 19 to 22 liters per 100 kilometers on a diesel vehicle so you can see there's a significant reduction and as energy density on the on the um fuel cell vehicle and really I suppose the point I'm trying to make here is if you take a one euro 70 um, you know, a litre cost of pump cost of diesel today and you work the maths down through it you know you can nearly see where H2 the, the pump price of H2 would need to be somewhere around eight to nine euro 50 um, per kilo uh, for it to be um, parity with, with diesel and fuel costs at the moment and operating a vehicle like that. So it's just to give a, an idea of where hydrogen pricing kind of would need to be to make it uh, equitable with, with diesel um, purely on the fuel side. Um, the I think the long-term ambition with mass produced hydrogen is that it would be a lot lower uh, than that, probably in around the five to seven euro per kilo. And if, if it can get to that, it becomes a much more attractive proposition for medium and long distance truck and coach bus operators at that point. Um, so that's, that's just to give a, a you know a, a very simple example of, of where things need to be pitched, I suppose, in the future. Uh, finish up with a couple of slides here. Um, Barry, I'm not sure if my time is okay. I think we're finished yeah, up here. Yeah. Won't, be, won't be long. That's, that's Look, right. Yeah. There's, there's a much, much bigger story in this whole thing, which is this bigger hydrogen economy um, and its potential for Ireland Inc. as a state. You know, when you look at that wheel there, it, it kind of sets out the supply and demand. We're really in that area on the renewable energies part on the top in terms of supply. So, you know, the, the hydroelectric, solar, wind, solar thermal, biomass, that, that kind of area there, electrolysis in, in as the supply chain. And then the demand side is, is over to the left there currently where, where I'm sitting is transport and fuel cell, uh, fuel cells and fuel cell engines. Um, but you can see through the rest of that bottom part where the um, the off takers, you know, could be for, for a large scale um, hydrogen production um, and hydrogen economy. Um, this one here just really, is, I just like it, is it's a nice little layout that shows, you know, from the top left there, if you have a wind farm producing 100% renewable electricity, it's pumping it into the yellow, the thick yellow bar there is the, is the grid, basically. Um, you know, off that, you can use an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen, which you can store uh, on the purple um, side, uh, or you could potentially mix in with the um, with with the, the gas grid in the, in the red, I think red band there, um, or you can you can use it to to put electric put electricity back into the grid. But the intermediary site there is where you're actually taking electricity from the grid and using an electrolyzer again to 
to store hydrogen and push it out into that purple um, supply chain, uh, or again into the into the gas grid. Um, and then on the far side, on the right hand side, is kind of at the end user end. You know, you can see transport buildings and industry there. So for the transport, you can see where you know from the grid side, yeah, you can get grid electricity there for charging vehicles. You've got the hydrogen storage site coming from an electrolyzer on site, or potentially coming from your wind farm end. Um, and same similar for buildings and industry. So it's it's just a nice little graphic that kind of sets out how that um, transport routes can happen for 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 hydrogen and how it can mix in with the grid and the, the gas grid. Uh, ultimately. Um, getting close to the end here anyway but ultimately you know you'll hear various different stories of different shades of hydrogen different colors of hydrogen for ireland i suppose we're really in, and transport in particular we're really only interested in green hydrogen here from renewable sources and um, electrolysis process and it's about kind of you know the, the power industry moving to that uh, away and moving the the, the whole system to 100 renewables and with hydrogen produced to transport and store it and use it in transportation use it in industries uh, power generation and, uh, and ultimately there's a potentially huge export market for it as well you take countries like germany are currently um importing large volumes of hydrogen from australia turkey finland you know and i think there's a strong feeling that you know with the resources that we have and the strengths that we have in wind and water and curtail electricity you know there's a lot of benefits there for the, the state in terms of road and rail between marine transport air transport even as well uh, big industry and big data centers as energy storage backup systems and power generation and ultimately as a global export fuel so to finish up what i'll say is you know i strongly don't see it as a case of is it battery electric or fuel cell electric it's not a competition and it shouldn't be a competition between the two most likely zero emissions technologies to emerge it's about using battery electric and fuel cell jointly to displace the massive volume of fossil based vehicles in the transport sector and consequently reduce that massive global CO2 contribution from those fossil based fuels. Um, and, you know, people say is one or the other. You know, we've lived comfortably with two fuel types for over 100 years. and There's absolutely no reason that we can't live with two um, for the next 100. So um, I think that's it. I'm going to say thanks for listening. And um, uh, if there's any questions, Barry, at this stage, if, uh, hopefully yeah. everybody's in that but um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, so interesting. Is there any questions? There's lots and lots of questions, so I'll try and get through in the last 10 minutes that we have, Ray, as many as we can. Um, no if you want a quick fire on these, let's see how we get on anyway. So um, Michael's asking, what's the life expectancy of a typical bus battery and what happens to the batteries at the end of their life cycle? Do we see waste batteries as an issue in the future? Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, our, our our buses. We tend to work on the basis of a twelve year um, life uh, for the bus itself. Uh, again, you know, we're at the start of this thing. So, in terms of batteries at the moment, what we're considering is um, kind of a six year cycle on the batteries. Um, it, it'll depend on what the, the the battery or the vehicle suppliers will come through in terms of warranties and things like that as well. Um, but we're kind of assuming at this point roughly a six-year cycle um, on batteries, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. In terms of the, um, the end of life on the batteries itself, uh, yeah, it's a huge, huge area. Um, but there are, um, you know, it, it's a developing area as well, I suppose, and, and you know, nobody has all the answers on that one yet, but... Um, yeah. It's okay. um, it, it is another part of the jigsaw. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ray. And then for Mayman, have you considered the option of fitting solar panels on the roof of buses to provide continuous charging while the bus is on its journey? Interesting. Stuff. Yeah, um, we don't build them, we don't design them necessarily in bus airing, but uh, you know, again, those kind of um, options, nothing should be discounted. I will put it that way. So. If that, if that, you know, if, if the bus industry, the bus manufacturing industry, um, come up with those kind of solutions and develop them, they can develop them and build them in. You know, even on electric buses that we have today, we, we're trying to think forward in terms of, you know, well, opportunity charging. How do we prepare the buses now to bring that in in the future? So there's, 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 it's an open forum in terms of what's possible, and um, it's just down to the industry to actually develop those. And you know, there's there's challenges even just to get, you know, battery electric and fuel cell vehicles out there. Um, so. Okay, great. Thanks, Ray. Um, from Michael, he says, 
Hydrogen is a very flammable gas with no odor or taste. What precautions are taken so that the gas doesn't leak and cause an explosion within the buses? Yeah, so um, the God, huge, huge area, which you could probably spend about another um, two yeah. sessions like this on. Um, look, I suppose the easiest way I can, I can say it in the few minutes we have is mm -hmm. nobody's going into this kind of just on the fly taking a, taking risks you know that aren't covered off there's a huge amount of health and safety and safety um regulations and stuff like that around um the construction of the buses the way they're they're put together around handling fuel and in many respects hydrogen is another fuel and um, you know we're we're nearly it's in nearly on a psyche you now and nobody goes into a petrol station and, and pulls a cigarette out while they're fueling the car like because you know mm -hmm. the signage up there so it, it all comes down to how the fuel is handled uh, and the safety elements that are put around that we've done it for petrol we've done it for diesel you do it for every you know cng it's done for everything so it, all of these systems have to operate under that same um those kind of same safety safety guidelines that's not to say you know every single um uh, fuel that you have there there can be problems with them from time to time you know we've all seen petrol cars going up in fire and stuff like that so oh, yeah. it, it does happen but, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Ken, thanks Ryan. Ken is asking are there are there inherently large efficiency are the large excuse me are the inherently large efficiency laws associated with hydrogen a big concern going forward I think I got that right eventually um yeah look at there are um energy efficiency differences uh, there's no doubt about that in comparison to battery electric but i think um the you know the the, the energy uh, the fuel cell the, um developments and the developments of the technology as well you know th there's there's developments even going on to try and improve that but you have to take it in the context remember what i said earlier on it's about using both technologies to try and achieve the zero emissions thing so you know one of the, the compromises you may need is that in those longer distance requirements where battery electric doesn't won't work for us or doesn't work or is constrained to you know the limitations on, on battery development uh, it may be a compromise that may need to be accepted but the point is from an engineering perspective is to try and reduce or, or you know you know, develop that reduction in in those losses as well. Mm. It's a, a question or a comment from Brendan um, uh, here, Ray, and I was going to ask you this myself. Maybe it's a bit down the road. Can we organise a site visit? So maybe not a now as things are, but maybe in the next few months I might come back to you on that if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, from David, did you look at the trolley bus option, like the Dart, the overhead electric lines? Uh, yeah, it's it's something you see in in certain cities across Europe um, mm. it's a difficult one because it's you know it's it, it we haven't been set up in that way I suppose in the past um, you know that there's there's changes that, that may come along like you know with, with the likes of bus connects coming in where a lot of there's a lot of infrastructural changes coming on the roadways and and that you know you could see shifts maybe from double deck buses back to single decks or longer single decks and things like that so um it's not the the overhead um, trolleybus kind of system hasn't traditionally been um, kind of looked at here in mm -hmm. that respect. And again, you know, it's like everything; they have pluses and minuses in terms mm -hmm. of the the transition costs on those and to compare them. But um, uh, again, I'm not sure. Maybe the NTA have done more work on that than than we'd be aware of as well. You know. Okay. Thanks, Ray. And uh, just a couple more before we finish. Um, Martin, uh, Porik is asking, do you envisage any changes in bus slash coach design that might incorporate both packaging the new powertrains and enhance passenger luggage accommodation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, you'll see some um, electric bus designs, say, um, around Europe, probably not from the main manufacturers. They tend to come more from the, the niche kind of end of it, um, where you'll see um, these modular uh, designs where say the, the, the wheels for example are out of the extremities front and back um you know these large kind of flat areas in the middle that can take um you know um, accessibility very easily and you know it, it, they don't follow the conventional bus design um mm. and there's, there's there's various different variations of that um and those kind of will come along and develop i'd say and imagine in time and and it, it's a little bit like you know 
you don't want to frighten everybody off initially in in the early stages of transition keep it fairly you know reasonably familiar um, and then you can get into kind of those those areas of development Jim. okay right last question then i'll ask you for the evening um, from philip what effect will developments in ai for autonomous driving have on vehicle range design of recharge refuel network etc interesting Wow, <laughs> that's, who knows? <laughs> that's that's a that's a big 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 question. Probably mm. another session again. Um, mm. Yeah, look at you know, there, there's there's a huge amount of um, AI kind of developments coming along where it all ends up, and and you know, there's that whole area of of you know public perception about you know how much of that is induced as well, how much they feel mm. safe and stuff like that. It's, it's a huge huge area, and. Yeah. Um, if we if we can manage to move on this kind of transition from the, the the drivetrain technology and get that moving first, it's probably something that will come along as well. I'd imagine, yeah. But it's, it's a big that's a big question. Yeah. So right, that's I've few, lots more questions, and I, I think we, I said to keep it bang on the air. So it, it's been tremendous, a, a fabulous presentation, Ray. Thank. You.